Thank you for listening. I'm Katie Abuzar, a Principal and Global Women at BCG Fellow, and this is a Women at BCG podcast. It is a well-established fact that diversity is good for business, and most businesses are consequently trying to be more diverse. But how do you actually do that? What really makes a difference? It seems that most companies don't really know. Today we're here to discuss BCG's latest publication, Getting the Most from Your Diversity Dollars, and I'm joined by one of the authors, BCG senior partner, Matt Krenz. So Matt, thank you for joining me. Oh, thank you. I'm glad to be joining you. Matt, as I mentioned, you're a senior partner at BCG. You're global chair of our people team. You're on the operating and executive committees. Outside of management consulting, what is your favorite hobby? I'm an avid karaoke singer. A karaoke singer? Yes, I uh, sang in a men's a cappella group when I was in college. And my joy of singing is carried on, and I guess maybe a little bit of being willing to make a fool of myself in front of people stems from those days. So if you catch me at the right moment, or if you come visit me at my house, I may make you sing with me. Matt, I can assure you unequivocally that would not be a good thing. Thank you for that. Now tell me, Matt, we're here to discuss the latest paper, Getting the Most from Your Diversity Dollars. But tell me first, why did you decide to look into this particular topic? So we have pushed very hard to think about diversity within our own company, within BCG. And one of the things we've seen in external research many times is that diverse organizations tend to perform better, are more innovative. And we also know when we work in our teams and with our clients, they actually are able to deliver better results. And so for us, Internally, building our diversity of all aspects and types was very important from a business imperative standpoint. As we've invested against that, I think we've also felt that taking what we are starting to see internally and furthering how we actually learn and advance our own internal agenda naturally led us to saying, are other companies seeing the same thing? A lot is going on, but women are not necessarily feeling the benefits of all this activity. Can you tell me more about that? One of the things we saw in our diversity dollars research was that the perceptions of what really has an impact differ by men in an organization and women in an organization. And in fact, the more senior men in an organization actually had the most or the most significantly different view of what was really having an impact and what was driving differences in success. And it was fascinating us to see that women in the organization had a feeling around things like retention and advancement in their careers as the most critical things that they thought organizations could do and focus on to make a change. Whereas male leaders and especially more senior male leaders really saw it more as recruiting women as being the most important and impactful thing. And this dissonance between what the experience of many women in the organization and what men were seeing struck us as really quite stark and very interesting in terms of what it would take to actually change gender diversity in organizations over time. That's right, because I guess most organizations are still led by senior men. And so what they think the obstacles are is actually quite important. I'm always struck by the data around the S&P 1500 and how if you look at those companies, there are more CEOs called John than there are who are women. And yet we know that equal numbers of women are coming into the workforce when they leave college and university. So it would make sense intuitively that it's around retention and advancement. So if you are a senior leader then, what should you be doing? Where is it actually that you are going to get the biggest return on your diversity dollars, so to speak, what really works? Well, what our research suggests is that as we cut the data by age, we also saw that younger males in organizations had very similar perceptions around the importance of addressing flexible work models as the women in those organizations did again. The younger generations we see desire to really be engaging both in that family responsibility says that flexible work models become very important. So thank you for that. So we've talked about flexible working as one of the proven measures. Are there any others in that category that you want to highlight? Yes, I think there's two or three others that are probably worth talking about. The second one to me would be 
CEO and senior level commitment publicly to gender diversity. Senior level engagement and explicitly calling out that commitment sends a signal to organizations that we see as then galvanizing action within the organization. Without that senior call to action, individuals, leaders in the middle of the organization will always question whether it is really a priority or not. And so that senior level view and constantly making sure senior level CEO in particular is engaged on it sends a very, very powerful signal throughout the organization. Now tied to that, it's nice if you say, I'm committed to it, but it's just words. The third thing would be actually the, the tracking and performance measurements that come along with that. But at the end of the day, we all know that, that if it's not tracked or measured, often you don't know where you are and how you're progressing. And importantly, it doesn't come back to the, the line managers and how they know what impact they can have. And I think the measures aren't just about the net outcome or changes. They very much need to be practical and ones that help track really the progress on a journey. So while you may want to, and we often report how many women there are as CEOs relative to those named John, what's probably even most important is being able to track what is the retention rate of women in your middle management level? And what is the promotion rate within each of your functions or business units? Those are things that managers control, you know, on a month to month or day to day basis that really will drive and change the results over time. I guess if you don't count it, you don't know what to do about it. In other words, if you don't know that there's a problem, it's actually hard to implement anything to resolve it. For many years now, we've talked about the number of women CEOs or the number of share of women on boards. And that is a long-term aspiration and near-term aspiration to change. But unless we change these middle metrics and the progress towards that, that end number won't change. You see this in companies that have taken on putting some clear KPIs in place. An example is General Mills. And General Mills really put some specific KPIs that they held their line leaders responsible for and that the CEO talked about and looked at and were able to move their share of women in the company's senior management from 9% in 2013 and over a very short period of time to 33% in 2016. And again, that's about building the management pipeline and the management leaders, you know, in a very tangible way that then can lead to those longer term, most senior level leadership positions. That is an impressive jump. It goes back to what you were saying earlier about the CEO, and it also has to go down to middle management because that's where really change is affected. So it has to be like a backbone to the organization. You know, I'd add in one other action that I think leaders and men in organizations in particular, but also women can take, which is we saw as a very powerful one is around sponsoring women. And I use this word sponsoring on purpose. It's not mentoring. It's not being a coach. Sponsoring to me has an implication of advocacy and going further than what many formal mentoring programs and organizations do. I would start with the concept of what we are calling moments of truth. And what do I mean by this? I think it's around how over a course of career, there are times where we all go through and we're making judgments about, do I stay in my job? Am I motivated by my job? And these are often triggered by changes in our life. They could be the birth of a new child. And at those points in times, especially I think for women, there are core questions around why am I doing the job that I am? And am I actually appreciated, valued, and having the opportunity to have real impact in the role I'm playing. And when those moments of truth happen, how management reacts has a disproportionate impact on whether someone decides to stay or to go. You know, from my personal experience, I know I've had several women that I've sponsored that at points, not necessarily when they first had their child, but maybe six months later, when they're really struggling with how are they balancing both the demands of the job that they like with that responsibility, being able to be appreciative, use those flexible work rules that we do have, and show the support around it and helping getting through what might be a one month, two months, or three months period 
actually makes a tremendous difference on somebody remaining engaged and aspiring to go further and deciding that the trade-off isn't worth it. And so it's knowing when those points of influence happen that you can actually really have a disproportional impact on retaining your top talent. I have to say that completely resonates. If I think about the moments of truth that I've had at BCG, definitely the birth of my children and feeling completely supported to come back to work in the way that suited me best. And actually for me, it wasn't about taking a step back from client facing work. It was about not having to travel. And that was the personal choice I needed to make. And I felt supported to do it. And then the second one was when we moved to Philadelphia and I came to work for you, Matt, in your team and feeling supported to have a sort of tailored solution to what otherwise could have been a real inflection point in my longer term career at BCG. So I think moments of truth is a really good way of coining it. So moving on, is there another hidden gem that you'd like to talk about? Tell me a bit more about addressing unconscious bias. At one level, organizations roll out unconscious bias training as a check the box cure. And we clearly saw in our feedback that those one and done programs or just formal training sessions, while valuable in creating awareness, actually don't tend to drive sustained change or sustained culture differences. What does really matter for unconscious bias is how do you take what you've learned from those types of discussions and really build them into your core processes, whether that be how you recruit, how you do evaluations, how you talk about individual development, you know, promotion. So how do you take those concepts, but embed them in the language you use in the job descriptions? There's the classic example of the Boston Symphony and doing auditions for their talent. And when they put the violinist behind a screen and could not tell whether they were male and female, some of those unconscious biases that tend to skew the decisions towards male beforehand went away. So let's do one more hidden gem. Which one would you like to talk about? There's one more that we're just starting to talk about a bit more, and that is engaging men in diversity. I think oftentimes organizations resource and staff up their women efforts with women. We have affinity and affiliation groups that are made up of women. Our own biases, it's affinity bias. Yes, And many of those ways of coming together do allow dialogue and sharing and creating visible role models that are of the same gender in this case. If we don't get men engaged in discussing this and make it about how do we all make an environment that works, I don't think we'll get there. How we encourage men to actually take advantage of flex work environments. The CEO of PepsiCo in Australia It's a very interesting example where he visibly talks about going home to go help with his children at 4.30 and making it publicly known that he is doing that. If we all embrace those things, then these flex work models have a much better chance of taking hold. But if you're a woman listening to this, how do you take control without waiting for a CEO who may or may not be called John to implement some of our recommendations? What can you do? So I would have a couple pieces of advice. One, I would say, and I encourage you to take ownership of your career. So don't wait, as you say, for somebody to deliver it for you. The second is, when you take ownership of your career, what does that mean? That means, I think, actually, when you're getting to a point where you're at a point of inflection or a moment of truth, that you don't wait for the organization somehow to recognize that that's happening, that you go bring it up and reach out and actually engage, hopefully, that person that is your sponsor or someone you feel close to. While organizations can have very good intentions, they don't always recognize what you're going through. They don't see the full picture. And so being able to bring that authentic self and the challenges you may be facing and engaging them will enable the the leaders and the organizations to actually respond. And lastly, I would say, realize that what you're going through at the moment will evolve and change. And the flexibility you may need, you should ask for, but also realize that over time, if you're looking for that role model that's exactly like you, realize that each person that has gotten to a senior level has found a way to make the flex and balance work. And I think 
asking what they did and how they managed through specific situations will help you figure out how to navigate your career and realize that where they got to, and you may not even have thought you could do. And by asking and understanding how they did those, I think it's a great way to help you then think about how you can navigate your career. And you might just find yourself a sponsor along the way. So I have one last question. We ask everybody this. If you could go back in time and find your 20-year-old self, what would you say to him? And the answer is not that he should have joined a karaoke group. I think starting out that I didn't fully realize and I would encourage my 20-year-old self to really think about is don't be afraid to ask for help. I think oftentimes you're starting a career and you're feeling that the onus is on you to figure it out, that you can't fail, that I need to show I can do it. And I actually think the world doesn't necessarily work that way. As a leader in my company, I'm looking for how do I help people succeed? And rather than trying to stand in judgment of people, I'm trying to think about how do I help them grow? And part of the reason I went in our profession into consulting is because I like doing that. And the biggest flattery you can give to somebody, I think, is often asking them, what do you think? Or what should I do? People are flattered when they think their opinion matters. And so oftentimes what can be a very daunting or intimidating concept of reaching out and asking somebody actually can be very empowering of a relationship. And when someone asks me, what do I think? How could I help them? It actually helps bring us a little closer together and actually opens a dialogue around what it is you're trying to do, what my 20-year-old self hoped to achieve. And when you do that, I think you start to build both avenues that can help support you. You take say, away some of the, the threat of what those relationships can be. And hopefully you get some good advice that actually helps you figure out how to take the next step in a way that you know, advances your career. Matt, thank you so much for joining us here today to share these insights. It's been our pleasure. Thank you. I appreciated spending the time with you. Thank you for listening to our Women at BCG podcast. If you would like to find out more about anything we discussed today, go to bcg.com forward slash women. 